Good evening. My name is Mary Murphy, and I am the Nancy L. Buck Pembroke Center Archivist at Brown University. On behalf of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women, I'm happy to welcome you to the 2022 Shauna M. Stark Out of the Archive Lecture Series with this year's speakers, performance artist Kate Borenstein, artist Jenea Kizzy, and scholar Virginia Thomas. In conversation, they will address our topic, what does tomboy mean to you? Before we begin, I'd like to share just a bit of context for those of you who are joining us virtually and might not know who we are. The Pembroke Center was founded in 1981 and took its name from Pembroke College in Brown University. Pembroke College had served as Brown's women's college and had merged with the men's college a decade earlier. The Pembroke Center continues the legacy of the college as a feminist research center devoted to critical scholarship on the struggles faced by people across national and transnational contexts, especially those whose gender identity or sexual orientation make them targets of violence. The Pembroke Center believes that redress is inextricable from questions of social, political, racial, medical, environmental and economic justice and demands an interdisciplinary approach to scholarship that can enable transformational change. The Pembroke Center is home to Brown's educational department program, educational program in gender and sexuality studies, as well as the Pembroke Center archives, which are my responsibility and which preserve and celebrate the history of Brown alumni, gender and sexuality and feminist theory. In 2019, the Pembroke Center Archives teamed up with the Providence Public Library to collaboratively produce an exhibit examining the topic of tomboy. The focus of the exhibit aims to interrogate the history of cultural expectations and gender norms for women and girls. Curated by the library's curator for Rhode Island, for Rhode Island history, Kate Wells, and myself, we hope to push beyond stereotypes of what people think tomboy is and instead invite them to think about what tomboy means to them. Two years and one pandemic later, the exhibit is now open in downtown Providence. Our programming this evening is happening in support of that exhibition, as well as we welcome everyone who might be interested to visit the exhibit in person through June 30th at the Providence Public Library. I also encourage you to visit the Pembroke Center's website to learn more about Tomboy and the Pembroke Center archives. I'd also like to let you know that tonight's program is being recorded. There will be an opportunity for audience questions at the end of the discussion, and you can submit your questions anytime during the program by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now I'd like to introduce Jenea Kizzy who will be serving as our moderator and as a participant in this evening's conversation. Jenea Kizzy is the Events and Programs Manager at the Providence Public Library. Jenea is also a professional artist, archivist, archivist and librarian. Jenea has served on the boards of Frequency Writers and The Dirt Palace and is currently serving on the board of Homosaurus, an international linked data vocabulary of LGBTQ terms that supports improved access to LGBTQ resources within cultural institutions. Jenea, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And thank you for your ongoing work with the PPL to produce and support our tomboy, our tomboy programming. Now I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Mary. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be able to introduce our two amazing conversationalists tonight. Um, we have Kate Bornstein, any pronouns, an author, actor, and performance artist. She has been around the world for over 30 years, has appeared on Broadway and on NBC's Blacklist. She's well known for, I'm so excited about that, She's well known for pioneering 
workbooks on non-binary gender, including Gender Outlaw and My New Gender Workbook, as well as her life-saving book, Hello Cool World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws, a book that has changed my life personally. Thank you, Kate. Um, and we also have Virginia Thomas, she, her, hers, a scholar of race, gender, sexuality, and the, vis and the visual with particular interest in how race shapes the legibility of gendered and sexual identities. Her book project, Dark Trees, Visual Grammars of Family and Lynching Aesthetics, and her public facing work has been supported by the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and she has been published in the Feminist Review. She is also the founder of the Queer Stories Project, capital R-I, in Stories, an intergenerational oral history project pairing LGBTQ youth and elders in Rhode Island to share their stories. She received her PhD in American Studies and MA in Public Humanities from Brown University and is currently the postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Rice University. We've missed you very much, Virginia. It's great Thanks, to see you. Thank, Thank you both for being here. Thanks for sitting and moderating this and appreciate it. This it's is a pleasure and an honor. Yes, I'm so excited about this conversation and especially to be here with both of you. So thanks for sharing space. Thank you. Uh, so let's let's dig in. Let's let's get into Tomboy to start um, thinking, thinking about the topic personally. Um, what does Tomboy mean to each of you? How have you experienced Tomboy in your own lives? Sorry, my camera just went fluid. It's going to happen. <laughs> no worries. If you want, I can get started yeah, while you navigate. I, I think we're I think we're okay here. You keep going. I I can talk while I'm doing this, I think. Okay, great. Virginia vamp vamp. Go yeah, ahead, I'll do it. So, um so yeah, you know, I First of all, I'm just really excited that you that folks at the PPL and at the Pembroke Center, um, Providence Public Library and Pembroke Center decided to do this exhibit on the idea of the tomboy because it was such an iconic figure for me growing up in the 90s. It was just like such an important way to think about gender and being a young um, cis uh, girl and now a woman. Um, it was always something that I felt in relationship to, right? And, um, you know, when I had the opportunity to kind of dive in a little deeper into the research um, behind, behind kind of the emergence of the tomboy figure, I found out that it has a much longer history, like dating back to the 1500s in England and probably other parts of Europe. Um, and as I continued to learn more about it, it just made more and more sense of why for me, particularly as a white settler person in the US South, why, why I was kind of, um, kind of, well, first of all, drawn to it in a particular way for accessing a certain kind of freedom that I didn't feel like I was necessarily granted, um, but also feared, feared in a way. Um, and I'm going to kind of go a little into the history and then, you know, kind of try to do it quickly. But what I found out was that, interestingly, this term emerges, like I said, in the 1500s. And at first, it kind of means an unchaste or forward woman, right? Um, and then by the 1600s, it starts to mean a young girl who's acting like a boy. And I found that fascinating because that was also the era in which countries in Europe were really starting to turn to places outside of Europe to try to engage in colonizing indigenous peoples, places, and resources, right? So I was like, hmm, there, there's got to be a relationship here. Um, and so I started thinking about how one of the ways that European colonizers, um, in addition to using extreme forms of violence, the way that they um, sort of validated or rationalized their actions was partially through upholding their norms around gender, particularly the gender binary, as a tool to say, 
these other cultures with other genders, black and indigenous genders are invalid, right? So we have, we're superior because we have the gender binary. Well, that meant they had to discipline their own people to conform to the gender binary within English speaking European um, contexts. So tomboy emerged as a way to police gender during that context. Um, so zooming back to my own experience, um, again, as a white settler person growing up in the Southern United States, uh, you can see the ways in which um, tomboy was still a term that in a way was used to police uh, the gender, particularly of um, young either femme subjects who like myself, who was like super into sports, super into climbing trees, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and and just used, used as a tool of violence at the same time, which is a conversation I'm excited to get into, clearly it's been reclaimed in a lot of ways too. So I guess I'm just like, the meanings to me just keep unfolding. I'm excited to keep unpacking it. Kate, I can't wait to hear, you know, from your perspective, what tomboy has come to mean for you, um, but that's kind of some of my initial thoughts on that. Wowzer. Um, Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> that's a lot, I'm taking that in. That, mm -hmm. The idea of using the gender binary as a means to police and and conquer i've been looking at the idea of where is gender and gender exists and that, that gender exists basically in three spaces a personal space nothing you you can be anything 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 personal space gender then there's another space would be a public space any public space that would have the um, ability to assign you a gender and in a role and enforce it. That would be a public space. And the third space that exists is where any two of those spaces interact. Um, and that's, that's the most interesting one for me. But When I was first approached um, by Mary Murphy to do this panel, I had never really considered my personal experience with Tomboy beyond the, the, the fact that I'm kind of partnered to one for the last 25 years. Um, she went to school. She, she had to play with the boys and the girls wouldn't let, them, let her play with them because she was too 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 dangerous mm -hmm. and um so so that's that's my partner but then thinking about tomboy i'm a tomboy once removed mm -hmm. um growing up i was a girl i knew i was a girl i knew nobody else did so but and i really enjoyed boy things I enjoyed playing Davy Crockett in the woods out behind my house. Um, I did all I trucks and stuff like that. I was not interested in dolls, but I was a girl. And so that was my experience with the privilege and protection of being boy. Mm -hmm. And then there was a big wham when I was an adult. And all of a sudden I went from tomboy once removed to man. All of a sudden, I had to be a man. And I, to this day, prefer boy and girl mm -hmm. to over man. And I'll even do woman, but I won't do man. Mm -hmm. So so seeing, seeing tomboy like that in my... I can I can switch on my my inner tomboy anytime and it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's it's the fun part of I think of who I am. It's like, well, I can dress like this and get away with it. Yes, I love that. I love part of what you're saying too. I think, you know, there's some different folks and scholars who kind of think of tomboy as a as a kind of way of almost reinforcing 
the gender binary and that it's girls who do any behavior that's not girlish is labeled boyish behavior. But your answer and the way that you've unpacked that is really showing like so much more of a complex space, right? That it's not, again, this either or, but it can be through and in and above and around. And I just love <laughs> that so much. So thank you for that. Well, it, it, you know, are we looking at gender as biological gender, which can also be called sex, which is, mm -hmm. um, or are we looking at it as in the mind or are we looking at some kind of combination? Mm -hmm. And I go with the some kind of combination moving through space time. So it's always changing. And I, I'm, I'm into that. Mm -hmm. I'm into mm -hmm. that. And, and in that way, we can call on whatever gender we have been and bring it to the fore that, that way. And I, I, I think people do that all the time without knowing that's what they're doing. Right, right. And in, in that, do you mean like, um, I mean, what I'm picking up from what you're saying, and let me know if I got this right or wrong or whatever, is kind of this idea that first of all, our gender is basically always in process. It's always, it's never quite stagnant. And at any given moment, we might draw upon a former gender expression that we existed in and access it in that moment. Is that like kind of what you're saying? It's beyond what I was saying, but I'm going to write that one down. Okay. So that's, <laughs> cool. that's cool. That's cool. Uh, um, landing for me. Right. Not, not to bring it back to the Greeks, but that reminds me of Tiresias, right? The, the wise seer who has been both genders and can therefore like see the future and the past, like mm -hmm. just the, the idea of having a gender identity outside of the, the spectrum of gender immediately turn, like gives you, uh, or outside of the binary of gender gives you, um, a new perspective, mm -hmm. not, not simply on, on gender, but on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. were, were both of you uh did you both experience tomboy as a as a part of your lives i um well virginia i'll i'll defer to you but i um i will say briefly i i have this very distinct childhood memory of going into um first grade wearing a dress for the first time and all of my classmates being like what are you wearing <laughs> because to that at, to that point it had just been like purely 80s fashion ash kosh bagash coveralls all the time and then I realized like that was the moment that I realized that gender had power and I was <laughs> and I I think I think we we have been talking we all have been touching a little bit about formative gender experience um, what would have been your formative gender experiences? What have been those moments of, of contact and, and electricity and, and knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess, you know, on this subject of in relationship to tomboy kind of, um, I think there are a number of ways that I think about that. And on the one hand, again, I was raised in sort of a traditional white Southern upper middle class settler family, right? In North Carolina. And um, I would say my parents were very encouraging of me to kind of live my best life, like go out and, you know, be and explore. And at the same time, there was this like cultural backdrop of, of a very narrow gender, a presentation that was supposed to be available to me. And I, I felt like I was constantly railing against that and really um, like, at, not that I wasn't enjoying wearing dresses and all of that stuff, but I just always felt like out of place. Right. And so, especially in sort of groups of my peers. Um, but I think what was, has been fascinating is that kind of um, as I've come out, I'm, I'm, I identify as a cisgender woman, um, but e coming out as queer, I just started being treated as if I were a different gender in some ways, um, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, so I thought that was also, it was kind of like the, 
the kid portion of me that also really was navigating like the sort of um, pressures around gender and sort of bursting out of that and challenging my male cousins to arm wrestling all the time and things like that. And then a later self that was like, oh, wow, I still have a lot of cisgender privilege and um, white cisgender privilege. And as a queer person, I feel like people do treat my gender differently. So it's, it's just an interesting kind of mix um, for me in that way. I saw tomboys growing up as basically girls who were saying, no, mm -hmm. no, I won't be a girl the way you want me to. And much later in my life is how I realized that what we've got today as gender and feminist and sexuality studies all began with some women saying, no, I won't be a woman the way you tell me to be a woman. No, 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 no. And learning no uh, is it has been the funnest part of my life. Uh, no, I'm not going to be a man. No, don't, no, don't want that. Um, and then, no, I'm not going to, I mean, I, I, I had my fun. I was a girly girl. And that was a lot of fun. But now I'm kind of back to, to boy. But the, I won't, I'll say it just one more time, just the ability to say no mm -hmm. uh, to a gender role, to a gender assignment, to a gender anything. Nope, not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's phenomenal power in that no. And... Um, but there's also, I was, uh, I was thinking about this a lot, reading some of your work, Kate, that um, there's, there's also a lot of pain in it. There's a lot of strain because tomboy and, and going outside of the gender binary represents um, a strain on societal, societal norms and also a strain on the people who are, who find themselves in the gray. Um, what, what, in, in your minds and in your studies, have you seen about um, either the human stories of dealing with that kind of strain when we were talking about policing gender, those kinds of things, but also the maybe even the importance or, or um, significance of, of pain for people who are living on, who are living in this world of, of gray. There's no role models. You can't, you, you, you can't go to too many movies or too many television shows and, and see a role model living in today's day and age that you go, oh, look, um, I mean, all right, before you know, the curtain came up, Janae, you and I were talking Star Trek and I know, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, and that's where you can see it. Um, you can see it in science fiction, and it and that's where it, it, it's it's a double bind because I see myself fiction, mm -hmm. and and struggling with that to to finally open the door as the gender you've wanted to be, uh, and letting people see you as that. That it's the scariest moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know what I've what I've noticed in terms of um, you know having formative experiences with with fiction is then people get to decide that they want to live their lives like fiction that they can break out of even more bonds that the that it doesn't have to be you know I if if I'm not if I'm seeing myself in this story then I can live in this story mm -hmm. um, and no one can stop me which I yeah. I, I love it. I, it's all over TikTok. It's a beautiful thing. Um, Virginia, how, how have you seen um, the experiences of people in your studies um, living in the, in the gray? Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking about what you're saying about fiction. And one of the people that I feel the closeness to um, 
is is a person named Polly Murray, who is a gender nonconforming African American activist from the early 20th century. And Murray is one of the first people recorded um, in, in a US context, particularly someone assigned um, female at birth who starts to pursue male hormone therapies um, in like the 30s and 40s, like really early. Um, even I want to say late 20s, to be honest, because they were born in 1910. So, um, and you know, there's been a lot of really important scholarship on like, we can't, we can celebrate Polly Murray, but we also can't erase the immense amount of pain, right? And the immense amount of struggle that Murray fought every day to figure out the world in which they lived in. One of my favorite things though, is a photo album that Murray created. And in this album, um, I kind of look at the ways in which Murray, and you know, a lot of people turn to this album to say, oh, like how can we see Murray as a gender non-conforming person, possibly a trans figure? And I do think that that's really interesting, but what I'm also interested in, which you're kind of tying into with this fiction piece, is the way in which Murray's engaging with the norms writ large around them. Like yes, gender, but also race, also class, also mobility, right? And just all of these different layers that Murray's like experimenting with, even nature, like doing really creative, interesting um, photographs with nature, right? And so for me, um, I think existing in that gray, like I want to honor the scholarship, particularly um, of uh, Black trans scholars who are really thinking and activists and just speakers and cultural workers who are really reminding us to not like over celebrate Murray, but also um, think about how that gray area, like you were saying, becomes a gray area that could actually access so many other planes. Um, and yeah, there's, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there, but that's something that I hold dear. And I'm really glad that you brought it up in that way that both of you kind of got to that place because I think it's really powerful. Yeah, thank you. I, I think too that that reminds me of, you know, all of our, our gender pioneering ancestors too. The, the ones that we have to find because um, history decided to encode them as, as something other, something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, tomboy can is, is one of those ways that a whole spectrum of gender can be, can be encoded and covered. Mm -hmm. um, when, when thinking about the use of the term tomboy and how many different people different kinds of people it would describe today, um, be that transgender folks, be that um, trans uh, people who are playing with gender, gender fluid, et cetera. Um, thinking about putting yourselves in the, in the role of, of a person from back then, would you stay with the term tomboy? Or if you found out that there, was, there were all these new terms, would you would you choose the new term? It's not a trick question. I promise. No. <laughs> In 1980, in the 80s, um, I I had gone through with my transition from male to female. And in the late 80s, I was realizing female wasn't working for me either. And that was horrifying. And so I started to call myself not man, not woman, not male, not female. That was the cumbersome language I had. Somebody some years ago invented the word non-binary and boom <laughs> go i wish i'd invented that <laughs> word damn um because in the same sense it, it it's defining ourselves by what we're not and i like that i think that opens up all kinds of doors and what you were talking about Janae, in terms of do we rush ahead and and grab the new terms or do we 
you know, do we hang on to what we've got? Mm. No, I, I say non-binary and save not man, not woman for moments like this, when I could talk about it historically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, I guess the question is, if I were that person in history, um, which I have not thought about so much, um, <laughs> but, but I think, I do think it's, it's just, for me, it's a kind of a both and situation because as a scholar, I think it's really important actually to look back at the terms and the ways that people were trying to bend reality, essentially bend the normative reality and what were they using and how are they using it? Because even though today we have these terms, we still have realities that we need to bend. And so for me, I look back, I, I think it's really important to look back and see how people were doing that with the, with language, with expression, with relationality, right? With community formation and, and actually be able to learn from that in the present. Um, so I think for me, I, like, I don't, again, I'm like completely, um, supportive and aware of how liberating certain terms can be. And yet I'm really fascinated by and think we need to look closely at the different ways that people were trying to bend reality so we can learn from that to bend our reality in the present. As we bend our realities with new language, we're making ourselves targets. And you know, the joy we have in finally discovering a place for us in gender and sexuality uh, seems to encourage opposition. And it would be crazy not to mention the opposition that's going on in the Supreme Court right now. And I hear a lot of people saying, oh, we're, that's taking us backwards and uh, we'll never go back. And in terms of, you know, backwards, backwards, mm, no, no, no. I, I lived through the 50s. It's livable, it's doable, it's even fun. Um, I won't say bad people, I'll say people who are operating on another paradigm. We need to be able to find out how to talk with people who believe in biological gender, that it is given by God or natural to, 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 to life. And we need to be able to talk with them, somehow figure out how they can live that. Go ahead. No problem. Part, you know, that's kind of true. It's been true for tens of thousands of years. Go for it. And let us kind of move on into science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I think that's thoughts without, that are... Go, oh, were you going to say something? No, no, no. With, you know, without making ourselves targets, the, mm -hmm. not to target each other. And the target part, I think, is really like helpful because it, I think that there's this thought that we have somehow arrived, right? That we're at this. And it's like the, all of that talk is very related to the narratives that actually the very dominant narrative of how, again, going back to thinking about the history of colonization, this country being a colonial empire right? And an imperialist empire. And so all of these conversations about we've made it or we're going back is actually all a part of that temporality, okay. right? And so there's a way in which you, all the points that you're bringing up are so vital for having us think outside of that temporality, right? In a different way. And we can learn from folks in the past of how they worked with that for the present and the future. Um, too. Absolutely. I was um, thinking about, I when we were talking about terminology, I was thinking about the, the idea of safety. Um, 
if I were a person in the past, I might I might choose the t- the term that kept me safest. Um, mm-hmm. To be honest, and there there are people and and times where it's it's better to say stay safe, but there is also this this working toward the frontier. And I think again, like you're saying, Virginia, we're we're not there because there's there's no there there. Mm-hmm. There's we're we're talking about like a multi-dimensional object. We're talking about something that is that is so deeply complex and so deeply personal that it's there's no there. Mm-hmm. Um at the same time, I um I I do want to kind of look at the um look at what the tomboy narrative does to um or or how it reflects upon um people who who don't quite fit into it um tomboy is a is a privileged term in in the because it's at the same time it's it's a police term and it's a privileged term and it's given privilege because it's so well policed um to me the term tomboy feels like um vanilla chocolate swirl like it's it's because it's got like the two separate flavors right next to each other it is allowed but if mm. you were to like say dump it all into a bowl and mix it up and make it even more delicious like that's that's all that's a whole other thing mm-hmm. um so what what are what are we losing when we stick with the either safety or privilege or policing of tomboy what's what else is out there what what's on the horizon I want to, unless Kate, you have thoughts. No, please. I was just thinking about the work of Kale Fajardo, who talks about, first of all, identifies as a Filipino tomboy, but also their work, um, or his work, I should say, as a a Filipino tomboy um, is on folks from the uh, queer Filipino diaspora and what what their work shows is that while there are certain folks both in the US and the Philippines who want to impose a kind of white feminine standard around um, tomboy and that potentially meaning like a dyke right or other form of lesbian or butch lesbian that in fact it's used by these folks in completely different ways right that it has that it actually still in this particular um study like it has the capacity to signify a gender beyond the binary right and that's how it's being expressed and used and i think that's where the potential like i don't want to erase those histories of the way that different folks have used the term tomboy and really just made it into something totally different. But I think your point about the way in which tomboy in perhaps a more traditional sense or in a more white colonial sense is that, um, again, like you said, it it can uh, end up reinforcing this like binary between male and female. And I think one of the things that's, um, really important to mention as well is that I'm thinking of like the work of Scott Morganson and Coley Driscoll here is that they've pointed out that a lot of modern sexualities that are legible are actually um, only made possible by the eradication of indigenous genders and sexualities on the lands in which we live. And so I think there's like your point, right, is that in continuing to use tomboy, there's a lot of ways in which people have really reclaimed it and are using it against a sort of imperial colonial way of being. And there's ways that in which it continues to circulate in that mode, right? And so, um, so yeah, that's kind of a long answer to your question, but I guess I, I hold it with, I hold it as a term with limitations and possibilities still. Wow. Um, I w- building on that, I would hold it as a term that's tied to age. At what point are you no longer allowed to be a tomboy? Mm-hmm. At what point do you have to put on the dress? At what point do you have to care, you know, take care of your man? Um, 
that those stories we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I enjoy saying no to age as a limiter on or even gender as a limiter on who can be a tomboy. Um, go on, that's it. Absolutely. I mean, that goes, I think, back into that, that like continuing to try to use tomboy as a way to break free from the way that it was used to police gender, right? As a kind of way to control young people so that they would, hey, understand, hey, you might be able to like run around right now, but don't you worry, you're going to be marrying a man, right? And you're going to turn into a woman. And I think like what you're saying is like digging teeth into that, right? And and kind of helping it be something else. In 1962, uh, I saw To Kill a Mockingbird when it first came into the theater. Mm -hmm. And scout i was scout that's all that's all i wanted to be and in my mind that's who i was so anyway mm -hmm. yeah um so looking looking then toward the future um and and maybe into into science fiction what what have you seen on the horizons of gender identity that is exciting you right now I, boy, I see people playing with gender beyond my wildest dreams. I go to like a pride celebration and I don't know what I'm looking at. And I'll, I'll ask and I'll say, how do you define yourself a gender? And, and I get laughed at. Define? <laughs> and you know, these are fluid and changing their minds and letting their minds wrap around it. And I've never imagined gender being played with in that way. Um, so that's what I see as the future. I, I'd like to see, you know, um, a country where a whole lot of adults are doing that. And, and you know, that's what I, that's what I have hopes for that this next generation is going to grow up and be in the Senate. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I think, you know, in addition to that, like, first of all, yes. And I just love, you know, I don't know, I, these days, I also feel like old when it comes to the queer gender, like, amazing revolution that's going on. And I just, you know, mad props. And I'm really like excited for the defiance that I'm seeing um, in younger folks. And it just, like, makes me filled with joy, but um, I like within that and with it in concert with it, like I've been thinking this whole time that I've been like digging into the tomboy conversation that, um, you know, if tomboy or the gender binary was used as a tool of colonialism, what kind of genders can we enact that can be used as a decolonial tool? And that's an answer that I think some people have and are working with. And I think, especially for folks raised in a Western context, we're working through it. Um, so that's something that I, I'm i really like excited to uh, hopefully continue to um, help grow or just be a part of in some way. How would that work? How would, how would, what kind of gender, um would decolonialize with it please yeah well i mean i think first of all going back to kind of again the work of coley driscoll scott morgison and others they're really and and many indigenous queer and feminist scholars who've really taken up this um concept of two-spirit and you know many other different genders and in indigenous contexts two-spirit is not the only term but it is one term um first of all those folks are just always have been kind of leading a decolonial anti-colonial way but I, I guess i'm really interested in how allies might not appropriate gender expressions but 
perhaps reclaim, I don't know, maybe reclaim some of our own older practices around gender. I don't know. Like, I don't know exactly how it would look, but I think our gender, the gender binary, I should say, and even sort of normative ways of thinking about LGBTQ folks are very steeped in land ownership in the United States. And so I think we need genders that can um, release that, right? And to like, um, to begin to change our culture, right? Around being so centered on colonial ways of being in the world. So I'm, again, I'm open to the science fiction at this point. I don't know, like if we're, <laughs> if, if I even have quite the words for it, but I think that's what I'm grasping at, or I like feel like I'm grasping at thanks to the scholars that and activists that I like have had the opportunity to learn from, right? Um, so yeah. I am, I highly recommend checking out the, the TikTok culture mm -hmm. of, of gender identity. Um, there are so many TikToks that are just ded dedicated to the gender of the day. And it's like, my gender is when the rain begins to fall and it's sliding down a window pane and, and you can, you can just start to smell the petrichor. Like that's, I love it. And I'm so thrilled for it. And, and people are just, I, I think the, one of the first steps in decolonization de colonialization is stepping outside of the box. And, mm -hmm. and some of that is, is humor and um, the absurd, but not in the, you know, school of the absurd sense, but like really just to do things that are outside of societal norms, you got to get weird. Mm -hmm. You got to get, you know, um, you can't be afraid of humiliation um, and you, and you have to have infinite love. Like mm -hmm. I, it's just, it's all there and I, yeah, do yourselves a favor, check it out. Oh, and and um, if you go to see the Tomboy exhibit, this is for everyone. If you go to see the Tomboy exhibit, they actually um, have a perusing of um, trans, uh, what is it? Tom, the use of hashtag Tomboy on TikTok and you can see all the different ways that people are using it today, um, awesome. which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some, very exciting questions lined up from the audience. Um, some are intense, some are looking at the past, some are looking at the future. Um, first, um, well, given that tomboys, at least in film and literature, are often associated with working class status, um, we can talk about that to start. I'm curious, what you all make of the emergence of not cheap boutique brands like Tomboy X and Tomboy Original. Totally. I, I mean, I think that that goes a little bit towards what Kate was saying around, like when we make our identities visible, that can be tools of empowerment that can be so quickly co-opted, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's even like, you know, during the 1800s, tomboy was actually used by upper middle-class white women more frequently. So there's definitely a varied class history, but I mean, for sure, I think the working class history is so important and it gets erased, right? Like it, how, how does the term get used to then erase that history um, through capitalism? Uh, I think is something that Kate's comments like brought up for me. Um, yeah. Gender gentrification. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, all right, our next, Kate, did you have anything that you would like to? No, that, that. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, one of the co-curators of Tomboy, Kate Wells. Hi, Kate. Um, Kate says, love the conversation uh, about language in the past versus the present and thinking a lot about the story of um, public universal friend who in 1776 said, I'm neither a man nor woman and use the pronoun thou. I think we're, we're headed back to the future, my friends. If you could imagine the future, what would you love to see become part of our language around gender? 
Um, or to putting our science fiction hats on, can you build a character and name them? Well, while you're thinking, I had an immediate person who came to mind. Um, the show Lovecraft Country on HBO mm -hmm. has, has a moment where um, a, a Black woman goes into the future and like, goes into the past and into the future and like rediscovers herself and becomes her own ancestor. Anyway, it's amazing, but um, everybody cries. But there's this space figure who, who comes and greets her and is like, name yourself. And just like in this amazing spacesuit, gorgeous Afro, just name yourself. That's, that's what I would want for the future. Mm. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Yes. I, I would go with that. <laughs> yeah. Go right with I'm that. speechless. That, yeah. that character's name is Beyonce, but not, you know, was not played by Beyonce. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, you know, I think that idea of like, Kate, you started us out at the beginning saying that gender exists in yourself, in the public and in a space in between. And I think that space in between and in the public are can be really violent spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so this idea of name yourself uh, as a kind of invitation from someone else um, I think, and, and folks are really doing that now with saying like, make sure you say, hey, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Do you wanna share yours? Um, is, a, is a good step in that direction. But I think that, that that name yourself is a really cool way of rethinking that third space. Um, I, I think I would love to see a definition of the third space, not a definition, but an acknowledgement, mm -hmm. you know, more, more so because we don't, we don't really say, you know, hey, we're in a we're in a personal, public-ish space. We're we're not looking at those those worlds as worlds. We just walk from one to the other and think that they're separate when they're they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and really being able to acknowledge that and and embrace the bleed would be a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Another one. Um, are we assuming that tomboy or tom girl is a pejorative term? Um, this is a question from somebody else, not, not me. I do not think that is true, at least not as I have understood it. Um, however, on the other side, terms like Nancy boy, are there are there other terms like this? Um, is is oh um other terms like this are clearly pejorative. So thinking, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize and say, you know, that there are there are terms that are also talking about this strain between uh, the gender binary. Um, where does tomboy stand on that? Um, is it is it indeed pejorative? And are the other terms that are used more pejorative? I was when, one of the first things when I was asked to take a look at this was the obvious absence of terms of uh, of affirming terms for the other the other side. Um, there's tomboys and there are sissies, and that's what that's what we're given once we have a gender binary. Um, but the use that gay men and many, many trans folk call themselves girl, just girl, uh, and redefining that and, and, and em embracing that as an identity. That's the, roughly the equivalent or the mirror image of tomboy. Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. affirming, it it's breathes life into it by, again, saying, no, I won't be like the way you want me to be. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about the communities of people that thinking about the term tomboy invites us to think about, which is you can have lots and lots of pejorative terms or terms that are seen as pejorative in the dominant 
way of viewing and that they've been reclaimed right and they mean something different and i think that that's us stealing back what we were talking about before like there's a way in which tomboy could be a form of empowerment yet when it gets sold as underwear it's kind of exploitative right or erasing but yet is there a way in which there are people bringing back tomboy and using it in a different way absolutely so i think that there's this luckily language is not stagnant right and so there's a way in which like i think many terms that people view as um, pejorative can also be reclaimed and are constantly being reclaimed in sometimes ways that really surprise me i'm like oh wow you're taking that term okay great you know like that's cool um, but yeah tomboy is really an underwear yes yeah um, um, man Tomboy X is is specifically what it's called. I may or may not be wearing some right now. Anyway, um, the <laughs> they've also made a deal with Target. Um, I, this isn't an ad. Just look it up. Um, so we are have, they fun? Ish. It it is gender gentrification. I would say, um, mm. and that's not an ad either. Um, yeah it's it could be more fun that's what i'll say okay. yeah okay <laughs> like i remember i remember back in the in the 90s like during during pride it would be like you made your own shirt you know and and that made it really cool and everybody was kind of like in their own thing and and now it's like you can literally anyway i'm oh I'm, okay okay i'm doing my little lament um and we have more complex questions to dig into um now uh what do we what do we do to respond to contemporary bullying of tomboys today mm -hmm. how do we manage a subset of society that measures their political power based on bullying gender non-binary people boy i have never been able to figure out how to talk to bullies it's the one thing I'm still grasping for, and I'm 74 fucking years old, and I'm going, how do you talk to a, a, a bully? Uh, I'm sorry, MF. Mm. So I don't know. I also really struggle with that, and I think what gives me a lot of hope is that friends who can help protect one another. I think it has to do with, which I do think queer and non-binary folks are already pretty good at for the most part is thinking about how we need each other, right? It's not just this single person going out there, but we really need each other. And I think I don't have like, I wish I had a very concrete takeaway suggestion or recommendation, but I think, um, I think that always keeping in mind that we are that we that we must be there for one another um, is really both key for folks who are trying to protect find protection themselves, but everyone else too. Like, let's jump in and support one another, right? Um, so, of course, that's an ideal situation, but I think it's about growing that culture. And I think, you know, young people are already so good at that. And I think we can learn from them in that too. I think you're right, Virginia, that that community is, is really important. It's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to talk to bullies or to, to deal with bullies because bullies, A, will always be there and B, are there because they don't want an answer they don't want to change their minds um their their intent is entirely opposite of that um i would also say too that there there are so many different roles in in our communities there there are the people who stand up and fight and say no and there are the people who who stay safe and and support others there there are the people who who wait out the bullies until they can be free mm -hmm. um and, and all of those are valid. Mm -hmm. um, we, we exist in this world and we, we have to see each other and um, bullies 
are 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 meant to oppose that kind of organicness of life mm. or that's that's what they do um ooh uh somebody asks i want to spend more time studying and learning about the past present and future of tomboy do you have any resources to recommend yes <laughs> star trek discovery <laughs> Perfect. um i don't know if this person lives in providence but if you do the exhibit really is a very rich starting place and there is also a pretty strong bibliography um and so i will I would say, and I hope, I believe that um, oh gosh, exhibition catalog is available. Is it only available in print or is it available online as well? I believe it's available online as well. Yeah, so there's a really, really, really strong, long bibliography <laughs> there. Um, I personally, I already mentioned this person, but Kale Fajardo's work, um, some of their articles may be protected behind, you know, unfortunate academic paywalls but um but you know they do talks that are on youtube and things like that k-a-l-e-f-a-j-a-r-d-o um their work is really useful in thinking about like a really um important way to think about the different ways that tomboy is taken up um so yeah but the exhibit it's great should go see it. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. All right. Um, now we have so many good questions. Um, I we we had a very complex question that I that I was a little um, worried might might be treading into um, the what what makes a woman a woman discussion which i'm i don't i don't care to have mm -hmm. um but i do i did want to um i would love to talk with you and hopefully this will satisfy the person who is um, asking the question um is there what what are the external markers of of femininity in terms of clothing and 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 how are they being broken today like what what are what are the interesting ways of um thinking about the the presentation of femininity um as somebody who was definitely very worried about breaking a nail while putting on my waistcoat um i <laughs> i i feel like there are really interesting ways to explore that I know, maybe it's a trap. I, hey, you want to jump? <laughs> why in. I was like, I. All right, we'll 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 table it for now because there, like I said, it kind of gets into what is female and um, and again, then we're talking about the multi-dimensional objects floating through space and time, very well, fast and hard to describe. I yeah. will say, can I jump in a little on that? Which Please. is just that I think that there, we've already talked a lot about the idea of the gender binary, right? And people tend to think that the woman side of that is the feminine side of it. And I think what's so incredible is that so many people are taking qualities that we see as feminine and changing them up and doing all kinds of things with them. So it's a process of destabilizing what we see as a binary, right? So it becomes very difficult to truly say what really is feminine, because that's not, that's part of the point is to really, um, I think, acknowledge that there are norms around it while destabilizing those norms. But Kate, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Femininity is, is 
it it depends on what age you're talking about. Like, I, are we talking about the 1600s? There was some femininity going on there uh, that isn't femininity these days. Um, are we talking about the 1960s when boys started wearing bell bottoms and flowered shirts and wear their hair long? Was that femininity or was that being a hippie boy? Um... Exactly. Femininity is, is, is a continuum mm -hmm. of cultural regulatory projection. Thank you. Yes. Um, I've, I've realized that I've taken us over time by, by just taking us over the deep end right before <laughs> eight o'clock. I don't, I, we knew this wasn't going to be enough time and it's, it's not enough time, but it's, it's been such a wonderful time to be speaking with you both. Um, and to, um, I'm sure the audience shares my, my feeling of being completely tickled to hear the two of you, um, expound and, and really dig into this. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm sure there's plenty of audience members that agree with me and most likely Virginia that we got to tickle out of you too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank exactly. you. Really. Yeah, it's been really great to be on here. Thank you both yeah. so much. And thanks to everyone who is in conversation with us that we can't see right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank as, you. as we run over time, pardon me, um, I would love to thank our, our speakers. Thank you again and our audience and the support staff um, for being here with us and sharing in this conversation. On behalf of the Pembroke Center and Providence Public Library, we would also like to say thank you to Shauna M. Stark and the Friends of the Pembroke Center for supporting this lecture series, Martha Hamlet and Donna Goodnow for organizing this event and managing event logistics, Kate Wells and Mary Murphy for co-curating Tomboy, Jasmine Lee Johnson uh, for illustration, illustration, Emily Rye for design, and Virginia again for your scholarship of the Tomboy exhibit catalog, and to uh, Christina Bevilacqua for Tomboy programming at Providence Public Library. Um, thanks again to all of you. Thank you to our speakers, um, and everybody have a great night.